Colorado has played a pivotal role in paleontology. Hi, I'm John Ferrugia. At the end of the 19th century, Colorado was the battlefield for Othniel Marsh and Edward Cope's infamous Bone Wars. Additional discoveries ranging from the first stegosaurus skeleton to the largest dinosaur track site in the U.S. continue to deepen human knowledge of these ancient creatures. Dig into Colorado experience, dinosaurs. Colorado is famous for its dinosaur discoveries. The evidence of dinosaurs living in Colorado millions of years ago is unmistakable today. The Rockies are some of the best dinosaur hunting grounds anywhere in the world. But there are not a whole lot of places where you suddenly find a huge collection of dinosaurs all in one spot. Those footfalls were actually a real live animal moving across the landscape. Dinosaurs are the coolest. This program was funded by the History Colorado State Historical Fund. Supporting projects throughout the state to preserve, protect, and interpret Colorado's architectural and archaeological treasures. History Colorado State Historical Fund. Create the future. Honor the past. With support from the Denver Public Library, History Colorado. With additional funding and support from these fine organizations. And viewers like you. Thank you. It might feel like Colorado is a pretty permanent place. It's the Rocky Mountains, it's the Great Plains to the east. But if you were to go back in time, you'll see that it's a really dynamic landscape. 152 million years ago, the landscape would have looked very different. Colorado was beachfront property. What we think of today as the Front Range of Colorado was a large inland sea called the Western Interior Seaway. If you were to go back to 190 million years ago, parts of Colorado were still under the ocean. You would have had dense vegetation near the rivers, near the ponds, near the lakes. You just kind of have to imagine something like a flat uh, plain. Very few mountains, rivers, slow meandering rivers, and a whole bunch of dinosaurs that were living in that system. Dinosaurs, so big long necked sauropods walking through meadows of ferns. And animals that you could barely touch the belly on if you reached up really tall, like Brachiosaurus, which was a really tall, large sauropod dinosaur. Big carnivorous dinosaurs like Allosaurus hunting those big sauropods. They would have been smaller than T Rex, bigger than you, big enough to eat you and say, seven or eight bites. Colorado 65 million years ago was a dinosaur highway. The front range of Colorado was a place where dinosaurs could move north and south and you can still follow in their footprints as you go along the front range all the way into New Mexico. We know throughout the Rocky Mountain West and the Morrison Formation as it's called, it's sort of the hotbed of dinosaur bones of Jurassic age. The conditions were right to bury bones quickly. One of the things that you see on dinosaurs is that if you don't have rapid burial, other dinosaurs come in and the skeletons get torn apart. And so you end up with scattered skeletons all over. And the fossil record of dinosaurs in Colorado is so great because as you were building the Rocky Mountains, you were also depositing sediments off to the sides. And those sediments trapped those dinosaur fossils. And later those were pushed back up by more mountains and we have them today. So it's kind of the story of mountains that really brings us the story of dinosaurs. The Mesozoic era that we think of as the age of the dinosaurs lasted from about 250 million years ago to about 65 million years ago. There are different theories about what happened to the dinosaurs, theories that revolve around volcanic activity and climate change. There's a pretty strong theory that an extraterrestrial object struck the Earth, a meteorite or a comet, that caused massive climate change and just changed the climate in a way that dinosaurs were no longer able to survive. Over the next 65 million years, tectonic plates moved, shifted, crashed into each other, creating the world as we know it today. Mountain ranges were formed, rivers began to snake their way from the continental divide to the sea, and dinosaur bones buried deep below layers of rock and sediment began to shift and emerge from the Earth's crust. The dinosaur story is a really young story for for humans. We stumbled across the first dinosaurs about 160 years ago, and those were found in England. Scientists were speculating a lot about what these large fossils that they were finding really represented. Were they natural rock formations? Were they evidence of biblical giants in the earth? But the first dinosaur fossil to ever get published was drawn by an artist, and it was the lower end of a femur, a thigh bone. And you had that knee articulation with these two big humps on it. 
and it was described as the scrotum of a giant because they had no idea that it could possibly be a knee from an animal that large. So they were looking to mythology to figure out what it was. They found skulls of mastodons with one large hole for where their trunk went, and they thought, that must be the cyclops. Or were these the bones of ancient dragons? Sir Richard Owen was looking at the dinosaur fossils that were being discovered in Belgium and the British Isles. And it was this brand new group of animals that looked strangely like birds, but also a little bit like lizards. And they were this brand new fantastic uh, monster on the, the landscape. And he coined the name Dinosauria, which uh, dino means terrible, and Soria is from Soros, the Greek for lizard, so terrible lizard. And he was the one to first come up with the name dinosaur. Across the pond, Americans began to make a few intriguing discoveries of their own. Thomas Jefferson excavated a fossil of a mastodon on his plantation in Virginia. And when he sent Lewis and Clark into the West, one of the instructions he gave them was, can you keep an eye out? Maybe there's still living mastodons roaming up and down the front range of the Rocky Mountains. He didn't know if these creatures were still alive or not. Sadly, Lewis and Clark were unable to find evidence of living mastodons. The first dinosaur discovered in North America was found on the East Coast. It was found near Haddonfield, New Jersey. It was called Hadrosaurus, which is a duckbill dinosaur. Haddonfield, New Jersey was really the breeding ground of a very notorious scientific rivalry. Joseph Leidy had a student who was working with him on the fossils from the Haddonfield Quarry, and that student was Edward Drinker Cope. And one of the people he gave a tour to was Othniel Charles Marsh. And he showed him the quarry and he was telling them what they were discovering in the quarry. And at the time, science was done by what is commonly referred to as gentleman naturalists. It was a very congenial society where everybody shared ideas and worked together. And it was a very refined process. Othniel Charles Marsh came from a very different walk of life. He had a very capitalistic view of the world of buying and selling and staking a claim. And when he saw the quarry operations at Haddonfield, New Jersey, he had made arrangements with the quarry owner to stop shipping their fossils to Joseph Leidy and Cope to describe and to ship them only to him instead. And that was really the start of Cope and Marsh's rivalry. In the early days of paleontology in the United States, it was still the Wild West. So it was still moving from the realm of talented amateurs into academic scholars. The Bone Wars are really centered around two strange characters. O.C. Marsh, who was based at the Yale Peabody Museum, and the other was Edward Drinker Cope, who was based in Philadelphia. There are two very opposite personalities. Cope, he's much more on his own. He's somewhat arrogant. And what they do is over a period of several years, they become world-renowned paleontologists in a relatively short period of time. But the Bone Wars is where these two really get into action and start fighting each other to see who can find the biggest and best fossils and also undercut their rival. The rivalry between Cope and Marsh ended up on the front page of the New York Times. Edward Cope was the first paleontologist to actually assemble a large fossil back into something like its original shape. One of the first flubs in the Bone Wars was the reconstruction of a marine reptile we now know as a plesiosaur. They're long-necked, flippered animals that lived in the oceans that covered a lot of North America. But he made one key mistake. He stuck the head on the back end. So instead of having a long neck and a short tail, had a short neck and a long tail. And the first person to point out this mistake, to his delight, was his rival, Marsh. And Marsh humiliated him over this basic error. Marsh and Cope grew to loathe each other. Just a venomous hatred between these two very outspoken, very ego-driven paleontologists who, who are trying to be the, the best in their field. It only got worse from there. The feud between Cope and Marsh is probably one of the nastiest scientific feuds in history. It wasn't until the bone rush and the discoveries in Garden Park and the discoveries near Morrison that Colorado really became the forefront of dinosaur paleontology. Arthur Lakes was one of the first big dinosaur hunters of Colorado. Arthur Lakes was a British immigrant who moved to Colorado and got a part-time job as a professor of English and elocution at the Colorado School of Mines. But he was a very talented amateur paleontologist as well. And on his days off, he would hike up and down the Dakota hogbacks along the Front Range. And he started noticing evidence of large bones embedded in what became known as the Morrison Formation, this treasure trove of fossil material. The Morrison Formation is actually a well-known formation in virtually all the West. You can find it all the way up into Montana, prolific in Utah, Colorado, 
all through Wyoming, down into New Mexico. It's a formation and it's a late Jurassic formation, pinkish and greenish looking shales and some sandstones. And so he began sending samples of the fossils to both Cope and Marsh. And so there's this major rush to uncover these Morrison Formation Jurassic dinosaurs. Now Arthur Lakes was a good scientist. He was trying to spread the knowledge that he had as widely as possible. But when Cope and Marsh found that they were both receiving fossils from this particular very rich find, Arthur Lakes found himself caught in the middle of something that he couldn't control. If you were to travel back in time to the 1800s, this was the industrialization of North America, and that created a lot of wealth. And with a lot of wealth comes a lot of free time. And a lot of these patrons were interested in Earth history and making big collections that they could parade around the big museums of the East. So at the same time, there was a gold rush. There was a bone rush to Colorado to find these fossils, to be the first scientist to make your name by finding a complete skeleton of an ancient creature. And they were sending huge teams out to the West, out to places like Colorado and Wyoming to look for strange big creatures and everyone was in competition to get the biggest meanest dinosaurs and ship them back to the east and show them off. Cope and Marsh went into the west with the express purpose of finding better fossils than the other one. Reports of fossils were coming out of the west and one of the main areas was the Morrison region and just to the south near Canyon City in the Garden Park region. These were areas that were known by locals to have bones and both Marsh and Cope sent teams out to investigate. And it turns out that these are some of the richest bone fields anywhere in the west. Marshall Felch and his uh, future wife Amanda both come from Vermont. They go on to, to go into the Civil War and they both both become hospital workers. They marry in Boston, they come out west, and then uh, through a really unusual set of circumstances, 1877, dinosaurs become something of interest and they get uh, pulled into the story. It was actually in 1877, bones have been discovered and Marsh hears about it. And the rumor is, by the way, they've discovered larger bones down in Canyon City. Professor Marsh contacts Marshall Felch and he says, would you like to go to work for me next summer digging fossils? And Marshall Felch is like, yeah, you bet. At the time of the Bone Wars, we were still learning about the geology of the West. There were still unknown formations, unknown rock units, and the fossils that they contained were still a complete mystery. As they begin to start this excavation in 1883, Professor Marsh said, I need you to write regular correspondence. I need you to describe what is it that you're finding. So he demands maps, he demands drawings. I want to know how it looked when it was in the ground. I want you to be able to correlate what you're finding with what I'm seeing when it arrives here at Yale Peabody Museum. They'd get reports of fossils from certain areas and they would throw together a team and send them out to collect the fossils, throw them into crates and ship them back east. And there really wasn't a lot of guidance. He said, can you send me some technical guidance on how to excavate fossils? And they sent him the Yale collection policies and those are just basically involve a sack and walking along and collecting fossils and you put them in the sack. Well, that's not going to work for dinosaur bones because a lot of times what you have is a dinosaur bone that's sitting there and it's completely fractured and it's sitting inside of really hard rock. Some of the techniques appear to be developed from plaster jacketing. They didn't have plaster initially. They're using a flour paste. A lot of people think that these techniques were actually developed in part from their Civil War experience working with uh, wounded soldiers. So they're doing everything they can to harden, protect, wrap, identify, mark, get them into a box, put it on a wagon, and then come down that slope that's over on the other side of the hill, go all the way to town, it's about an eight mile journey, and then they go to the train station and then unload it, ship it all the way back east. One of the problems when you have too many fossils coming out of the ground at once is there's always potential for mistakes in identifying animals and naming animals and how you put animals together. And they were digging up lots and lots of fossils and they were quickly describing to get the names out before their rivals. And there is one animal that was given about 12 different names. But in science, the first name always gets priority. At this time, there were also great public events that were around the unveilings of new dinosaurs and new species. So this was fueling an appetite in the newspapers and also in the big museums out east for new discoveries. And so the public had a huge appetite for dinosaurs. Of the 80 new species that they claimed to have discovered, only 32 were found to be valid, authentically new discoveries. Well, the biggest result of the Bone Wars was this new appetite for discovery, and it drove dinosaurs dinosaur 
paleontology for about 50 years after. The downside of Copeland Marsh is that they brought a lot of disrepute to the idea of paleontology. They treated it like a foot race, where there was one winner at the end. Copeland Marsh, eventually, their rivalry got the better of them, and they both ended up dying early, unfortunately. But it did a lot for paleontology. Though Othniel Marsh and Edward Cope stole most of the paleo attention at the end of the 19th century, other bone hunters were hard at work making their own discoveries. One such fellow, Elmer Riggs, took a few ideas from the early gold seekers. So when you're prospecting by horseback, you tend to go a little slower than, say, riding from town to town. And you just look over the saddle at the ground as you're walking by, and you'll see plants and you'll see rock. And what you're looking for is something different. And you'll find something that's a different color or a different texture, and you'll dismount off the horse you'll start to look at it, and sometimes it's bone weathering out of the hillside. So in 1901, Elmer Riggs and his crew started digging near Fruta, and he found a partial skeleton of a patasaurus. They found the base of the neck, they found the trunk of the body, they found the limbs, they found most of the tail, but it was a really great specimen, and Elmer Riggs later said that it was probably the most important specimen of his career. In 1903, he publishes his paper on the specimen, and he's looking at the patasaurus as well as the brontosaurus material from Coma Bluff. He said, all the differences in the skeletons between Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus have to do with their age. One is a young specimen, one is an older, more mature specimen. So Brontosaurus is just a different version of Apatosaurus. And because Apatosaurus, the name came first, the name stuck. And so what he did in 1903 was prove that Brontosaurus didn't exist. In Colorado, specifically after the Bone Wars ended, there was this huge appetite for more discoveries. Dal Deweese is a very important local Canyon City figure. He was trying to reignite these Bone Wars and continue continued hunting for dinosaurs. And he discovers a dinosaur, and he doesn't know what to do with it, and he contacts the Colorado Museum of Natural History. So in the summer of 1916, the first team funded by the Denver Museum was down in the area around Canyon City, hunting our first dinosaur, and they collected what's now known as the Deweese Depoticus, and it sits in our collections today. But it's really interesting, how did they get that out? It was so far remote that they couldn't get a road or anything in there. They built a sled, and then used a single large horse to pull the sled and pull those bones up out of that canyon. And a Diplodocus is what we call a sauropod dinosaur. It had a very long neck. It was a plant eater, really long tail. And it was one of these really big, giant dinosaurs that was all over the landscape from Wyoming to Utah during the Jurassic. In southeast Colorado, near the town of La Junta, along the banks of the Purgatory River, lies an area of Comanche National Grassland known as Picket Wire Canyon. Surely discovered by Native Americans and early Anglo settlers, this special spot did not make it into the history books until the 20th century. About the year 1934, a young woman named Betty Jo Rittenauer, she had traveled to this area on horseback just exploring and came across this geologic wonder. She was convinced these look like fossilized tracks of what must be dinosaurs. What is really special about the place is there are thousands of dinosaur tracks exposed along the banks of the Purgatory River in a limestone. So all of the tracks here, which are Jurassic in age, were naturally exposed. Apatosaurus, Allosaurus, walked in the mud along a shallow lake more than 100 million years ago and left their footprints. In the case of these tracks, there had to be a very special set of conditions. Probably as these animals were walking through a muddy flat, the tracks baked hard and dry in the sun. And then when the lake reflooded these tracks and covered them with successive layers of muddy sediment, they were preserved in that way. The animals were here. They were moving through this area. And given the other evidences that we see, it probably was some kind of a migration route or a route that big herds of animals would travel. These animals were so large, 20 ton plus animals moving across the landscape. They would leave such deep footfalls that the pattern of rights and lefts and rights and lefts is very dramatic and that's why they're so deep. It wasn't until the mid-1980s that Dr. Martin Lockley of UC Denver came down and did the first formal census and mapping of these trackways. He determined this is among the first, if not the first place, that communal behavior or herding behavior in dinosaurs was recognized. Tracks are a study of behavior. We can learn a lot of things from skeletons, but one thing we can never learn from skeletons absolutely, bones and teeth, is behavior. When we look at a trackway, we're studying behavior. They recognized that there was evidence of herding behavior, and most of the big herbivorous dinosaurs were recognized to be a group of teenagers or sub-adults. 
Additionally, we now have evidence that a lot of the carnivores at this site were moving in the same direction as the plant eaters. So it's almost as if the meat eaters were hot on the heels of the plant eaters. It's the largest mapped assemblage of dinosaur trackways in North America. And the Forest Service, through its volunteers, have continued to excavate portions of the site that the river reburied, and we're approaching 2,000 tracks that are exposed here now. The Purgatory Valley track site is both the biggest dinosaur track site in North America, and it's the first place that herding behavior in dinosaurs was really taken seriously and discussed. So that's the real magic, and that's what we're building on with the science. So you can walk along the bank of the Purgatory River, and you're walking in the footprints of monsters. The state fossil of Colorado is the Stegosaurus, which is really appropriate because the first Stegosaurus was found in Colorado, but also the three most complete skeletons of Stegosaurus have been found in Colorado in the area around Canyon City. The Stegosaurus is one of the most iconic dinosaurs. It is about the size of a small bus, it has a fairly small head, it has a long tail with spikes at the end of the tail, and it has these beautiful plates along the midline at the back, and big, broad, diamond-shaped plates that go all the way along the back, and they're really quite lovely. In 1937, a local high school teacher by the name of Professor Kessler. He's actually out working with high school students here in Canyon City. And Professor Kessler discovers the beginnings of a stegosaurus. And he contacts the Denver Museum, who's got a good paleontology staff by then on board. And he says, I've discovered something important. They send their excavator down to Canyon City and they begin excavating in 1937. By 1940, an amazing stegosaurus goes on display at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And in the early 1980s, students at McElwain Elementary School nominated the stegosaurus as Colorado's official state fossil. That particular stegosaurus is now a Colorado state fossil and that was discovered in Canyon City. In the 1960s, paleontologists were developing some radically different ideas of what dinosaurs look like and how they behave. So the 1960s, early 1970s are termed the dinosaur renaissance, and it really started with Dr. John Ostrom, who was really instrumental in starting the dinosaur renaissance. At the University of Colorado, a number of paleontologists, including Robert Backer, were involved in completely revising our image of dinosaurs as these slow, dull, cold-blooded lizards. And it was the discovery of a dinosaur called Deinonychus. Deinonychus is related to the Manoraptorans, which are called the raptors in Jurassic Park. They're really small, agile, long-armed, long-limbed, sickle claw on the foot, predatory dinosaurs. And as he was describing Deinonychus from Oklahoma, he was noticing that the anatomy was extremely bird-like from the wrist to the pelvis, to the legs, to the skull, to the vertebrae. He brought back that idea that was originally proposed by Sir Richard Owen centuries before, that dinosaurs and birds are really closely related, and that just pushed the dinosaur paleontology from, oh, these are old, ancient, big lizards. And arguing that dinosaurs were much more dynamic, that they were warm-blooded, that they were much more active than we thought they were, that they had very sophisticated herd patterns and, and behavioral patterns and they would have been colorful. They would have been hunters. And what that did was it opened up all these new questions, all these new hypotheses to test and to really drive dinosaur science further. And so this new dinosaur renaissance started to think of dinosaurs as living creatures for the first time. One of the things about the fossils from here that's both wonderful and makes it tough is that a lot of times the skeletons are joined together. And when the stegosaurus that was found in 1992, the entire body was still intact. And when they looked at it, they said, there's no way we can remove it without destroying it. We have to take it out in one piece. So they excavated over top, they did the preservation, and then a local mining company by the name of Colorado Quarries drilled underneath the whole skeleton, put large beams, tied it all together, and it was that structure that enabled the whole thing to be airlifted with Chinook helicopter instead of Steep Valley. So a Chinook was the only way to do it. So fortunately, we were able to contact Fort Carson, and they provided a great helicopter pilot who had been in the Vietnam War, and he said, this might be the most interesting thing I've ever lifted. So it was pretty fun to see the thing actually come up out of the ground in a single piece and be brought back. Colorado has a long history of dinosaur exploration, and the hunger for paleontological discovery continues today.
Cope and Marsh, all of their effort was pushed into digging up dinosaurs before their rivals and naming them first. What we're doing now is we're doing sort of these larger scale analyses. And for the last 150 years, every new discovery has really pieced in that puzzle about what dinosaurs looked like, how they behaved. And in many ways, the last 20 or 30 years have been a new dinosaur renaissance. We are still making new discoveries. We are still uncovering new pieces of evidence. And today it's so much more interesting than it ever was. When contractors were building Coors Field, they found part of a triceratops skeleton underneath own plate. A lot of paleontologists say that the best fossils are still waiting to be found, and that really is true. There are monsters in our backyards today. Dinosaur fossils, fossils of ancient sea life, fossils of mastodons dot the entire front range in Rocky Mountains and Great Plains. Each one tells a little bit more. There's a little bit more to the story. And so this amazing rich fossil record is one of the most important windows into that history. We study the past to learn more about ourselves and we live in a fascinating world. And the fact that Colorado is this rich repository of the ancient past teaches us a little bit about how we live in this amazing landscape today. Colorado is really the birthing ground for Morrison paleontology, which has shaped the entire dinosaur gold rush of the 1800s, which has then filtered in through pop culture, through the dinosaur renaissance to today. For many people, when they get in touch with what's around them, what's under their feet, and you begin to realize how magical this planet is and has been for a really long period of, of time. And places like Picket Wire Canyon lands just really deepen and accentuate that deep history that Colorado has. And it's not just dinosaurs, it's life before dinosaurs, life after dinosaurs, and certainly life during the time of dinosaurs, like in the Jurassic. A lot of work continues to be done in Colorado, and I think the next decade or two decades, we're gonna have a lot of new big discoveries coming out of Colorado that will really change the way we think about dinosaurs. You think of all of the historical dinosaur quarries that are here, and you throw in something like the largest dinosaur track site in North America into the mix, that's a pretty cool blend right there. Dinosaurs in Colorado are some of the first and best examples from anywhere in the world, and Colorado has some of the best fossils and will continue to produce great fossils for years to come.